Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's time once again, it being Tuesday, for our weekly ISM segment. And today I'd like for us to consider uh, a Greek philosophy known as Epicureanism. Epicureanism. E-P-I-C-U-R-I-A-N-I-S-M. Epicureanism. And Epicureanism came uh, to the forefront, as did uh, uh, Stoicism and uh, Hedonism and Sophism, uh, in the aftermath of the impasse between Parmenides and Heraclitus. Parmenides is the one who said, whatever is, is. Heraclitus is the one who said, no, whatever is, is changing. And there's a one and a many uh struggle there as each one mistakenly tried to reduce uh, a both and into an either or. Uh, And that led to a a level of skepticism. And out of that skepticism arose these various uh, sort of uh, subcategories under skepticism, one of which is Epicureanism. And it is, in a sense, a cousin of hedonism. That's a word we're a little bit more used to uh, in our modern vernacular. Hedonism uh, is the idea that uh, the good life is found by uh, the pursuit of pleasure. And certainly Epicureanism could could follow right under that same definition. definition. Epicureanism is also found, uh, the meaning in life is found in the pursuit of pleasure. The distinction, however, is twofold uh, that are both related to each other. Probably the most dramatic or visible distinction is this. The difference between the hedonist and the Epicurean is the nature of the pleasure they were seeking. The nature of the pleasure they were seeking. And second, the difference would be the methodology for the pursuit of that pleasure. First, on the nature. Uh, the hedonist was much more crass, much more uh, beastly or animalistic. Uh, the hedonist is the one who hasn't learned the lesson that there are costs to the pleasures that we pursue. If you drink too much, you can end up with a terrible hangover. If you sleep around too much, you can end up with a sexually transmitted disease. If you uh, carouse and live a raucous lifestyle, you probably won't make a terribly good living. There are costs associated uh, with the wanton pursuit of pleasure. But the hedonist says, I don't care. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow I die. The Epicurean, on the other hand, is much more urbane and sophisticated. He will pursue pleasure recognizing the costs and seeking to minimize uh, the, the, the cost and maximize the pleasure. The hedonist will uh, down a case of beer Uh, knowing that he's going to have a terrible day the next day. The Epicurean is the one who carefully sips his single malt whiskey. Uh, Another way of putting it is the hedonist is the one who will uh, gorge himself on Twinkies, uh, whereas the Epicurean is the one who uh, delights in an elegant and well-prepared Flan or a uh, what's that sort of custardy stuff where they burn the top? I can't remember what that's called. I'm not much of an Epicurean. 
Uh, so again, both pursuing pleasure, but one of them pursuing it a little bit more intelligently, a little bit less recklessly. The other difference is even in the nature of the pleasures. That is the Epicurean is one who's willing to say, well, you can find pleasure in a pleasant conversation. You can find pleasure in witnessing a beautiful sunset. You can find pleasure in all sorts of kind of uh, higher, again, less crass uh, means. And the, the, that's, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so the Epicurean is sort of a, a, a stuffy, uh, cautious, careful uh, pursuer of pleasure. But the ultimate goal, the end goal for both of these groups or both of these ideologies is the same. It's still, I want to maximize pleasure. I'm living for myself. I am... Uh, unconcerned with anybody's authority but my own, uh, except insofar as it will help me to pursue my goal of pleasure. They're both profoundly selfish. And it's important for us, whether we're looking at our own hearts and our own behaviors, or whether we're looking at how uh, we interact with others and who we interact with, to recognize that uh, that... Uh, subtle distinction is really not too terribly important. That is, the, the, the less crass pleasure pursuer is probably not any healthier for us to be around than the more crass. And I think we should also note more often than not that uh, a, a full, co fully committed uh, Epicurean will soon enough devolve into a hedonist. My father used to say to me, if you have a cannon, fire it. What he meant by that is that uh, when you've got something useful, you're in the context of a battle, uh, you've got a, a powerful and potent weapon, then of course, put it to work. Don't be afraid. Don't hold it off in reserve. Well, as the Jesus Changes Everything podcast has uh, grown uh, and matured. Uh, one of the things that we have noticed is that every time Lisa's on, we do so much better. We have so many more downloads, which doesn't surprise me at all. There's a reason I married this woman. There's lots of them, actually. But one of them is that Lisa is a woman chock full of biblical wisdom. She has the character to be open and to be honest and to look to God's word for, for wisdom and guidance and direction. That's why I have her with me in the Life in the Blender segments that we do. It's why I invite her to do segments with me on curating your movie library. But it's also why, about once a week or so, I ask her to come on and do a segment all on her own. A segment we call The Purpose Driven Wife. Lisa has a blog by that same name that she writes for from time to time, a Facebook page. I invite you to check it out. But now she also has a segment every now and again on Jesus Changes Everything. And you're about to enjoy one. That ancient serpent. 2 Corinthians 2.11 tells us that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. The slanderer slithers, enticing our ears to seduce our hearts with lies. He presents our deepest fears, pokes our freshest wounds, goads our hungriest curiosity, exploits our weakest flaws. He seeks to destroy. Beware! He doesn't lick or snack or graze upon us. He devours. He does how does he know what makes you tick? Where your hidden secrets lie? He knows because it's his job. He's a student of us. He has minions under his command to carry out his orders. He is the father of lies. And when he lies, he speaks according to his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies, says John 8.44. He comes as an angel of light 
feigning godliness. You cannot always smell his stench, see his pitchfork and horns. Rather, full of trickery and deceit, he aims to divide and conquer, confuse and distort. He hides what is true, blinding us to the power of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 proclaims the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Satan masquerades in a costume of light. Paul says that some people are posing as believers who are not. He explains like this in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. He says, Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is not strange if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In other words, Satan's have Satan? In other words, Satan has servants who profess enough truth to join the church and from inside teach what Paul calls the doctrine of demons, according to 1 Timothy 4.1. Jesus says they will be like wolves in sheep's clothing, Matthew 7.15. In Acts 20.30, Luke says they will not spare the flock but will draw people away from destruction without God's gift of discernment our love will be hoodwinked, vetted by our stupidity. Satan will perform signs and wonders. The last day describes like this. The coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be all power and with all signs and wonders. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.9 Are these real signs and wonders? Jesus describes the last days like this. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. There is no hint that these signs and wonders are fake, full of tricks. Let our faith be grounded in the word of God that he may give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Saints, get in the game. Learn the strategies that God outlines for us in his word. Gear up. Our Father has provided us with armor. We must put it on. Where is that armor located? Look in your Bible at Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. We must ask God to put on We must ask God to open our spiritual eyes. Remember, although people may be seeking our destruction or seeking to control, the battle is not of flesh and blood, but with demons in earth suits. Ask for heavenly wisdom. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do from it. Above else, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips and let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Proverbs 4, 23 through 27. Ephesians chapter 6, 12 tells us for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. Of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms psalm 26 says dear one be strong in the lord and in his mighty power for at the appointed time he will save his anointed and romans 8 31 tells us if god is for us who can be against us We come now in our ongoing uh, series on the parables to the parable of the ten virgins. And I am, in some sense, very reluctant to speak on this parable because uh, it was that parable uh, for which uh, or on which one of my great heroes was most known to speak. His name is Dr. John Gerstner, and he loved to preach on this particular 
text. And when he did so, he had a tendency to put the fear of God in uh, his audience. Uh, my dad used to talk about how uh, every time Dr. Gerstner would speak on this, he would have uh, counseling sessions uh, going out indefinitely because of people struggling with issues of assurance. Well, before we get to why that might be, let's consider the content. You are somewhat familiar with it. Uh, there are 10 uh, virgins who are awaiting the arrival of the bridegroom. You may know uh, a lot of the study on the meaning of this text is centered around uh, the habits of uh, how marriages and weddings uh, happened in that era and in that place. And it was certainly the case that uh, typically uh, the betrothal happens, the commitment is made, uh, but it's not finalized until the groom has finished preparing a place uh, for his bride-to-be. But as soon as he's done so, it's time for the wedding. And no one knows for sure. If you ever had a construction project, you never know when it's going to be done. So you might be waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And what happens is when that time comes, typically there's a process. The groom comes to the bride's uh, home and there's some ceremonies there. And then in the evening, after the sun has gone down, all the celebrants return to uh, the groom's home, uh, each of them carrying either a lamp or a torch, something lit up. And that lamp or torch sort of served as uh, a sign that you are a part of the wedding party. If you didn't have one, that meant you didn't know that this was about to happen, which meant you weren't invited. Some of them had sufficient, uh, five of them had sufficient uh, oil for their lamps and five did not when the groom showed up and the five who did not were in despair, but the five who did would not give of their oil and the five who did not were left outside and the bridegroom says, I never knew you. There's the quick uh, summary of the content. Well, it's obviously the case that Jesus is the bridegroom in this story. And so it is a story about uh, when he comes for his bride. And there's dispute about that. Is this speaking about him coming in a dispensational rapture kind of sense? Is this speaking about him coming in an establishment of uh, the kingdom on earth kind of sense? Is this him coming in 70 AD kind of sense? Well, the good news is we don't have to figure that out to uh, draw the lesson uh, that he makes clear we're supposed to draw, which is this, we're to be prepared. And I would add this, the only way to be prepared is to have faith, to have the oil of the Spirit. So really what you have between these 10 versions is you have five of them who have that faith, who have the Holy Spirit indwelling them and will not run out. You've got five virgins, however, who do not have it, who are nevertheless a part of the community at this time as far as anyone can tell. But when the bridegroom comes, we discover, lo and behold, hey, they were not really with us. Let me share just a minute, if I could, a, a good description of this uh, that I found at gotquestions.org. It says this, the five virgins who have the extra oil represent the truly born again who are looking with eagerness to the coming of Christ. They have saving faith and have determined that whatever occurs, be it lengthy time or adverse circumstances, when Christ returns, they will be looking with eagerness. The five virgins without the oil represent false believers who enjoy the benefits of the Christian community without true love for Christ. They are more concerned about the party than about longing to see the bridegroom. Their hope is in their association with true believers. Give us some of your oil. Their hope is that that association will bring them into the kingdom at the end. This, of course, is never the case. One person's faith in Jesus can never save another. One of the things, this, this, this should be a good, uh, yeah, good place to make this illustration. One of the things that I've been hearing from a lot of pastors 
is in this post-COVID time period, many of the folks who didn't come to church when everything was locked down have continued to not come to church when things are opening up. But what's interesting is for most of the people that I've talked to, their giving has not gone down. So there are apparently these huge swaths of people out there who used to go to church, who now watch church online, and who give to the church, but who aren't willing to gather with the church. I'm not saying all those people are the virgins without the oil. I'm not saying that at all. But I am trying to show you that there is a difference between people who want to be a part of the institution and people who long for the return of the bridegroom. Friends, this is supposed to be a warning to us, but the solution is not how good am I? The question, the answer to the question is, am I asking myself? Am I crying out, come Lord Jesus? You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsprouljr.com. And join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.